Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and Statue Ministries. Thank you for taking part and being here today. We are blessed to have the presence of, of uh, people here in the room and those online watching. Um, we're, we're right in the middle of a series um, called Why Ask Why and the Overweight Brain. And so I wanted to review a little bit from last week. We, we went through a lot. And if you took notes, hopefully um, you're able to keep up. If not, you know, go back and, and listen to the first one. Um, in, the, in the first one, last week, we were talking about um, the theme of the overweight brain and what that is, is being bogged down with endless unanswered why questions, right? Um, we get to a certain point from when we have our, our salvation experience of being in the indicative mood in the four moods we, kept, we covered. But we start out in the open mood, which is the, the fruit of the Spirit and experiencing the peace of God and joy even in our relationship with the Lord. And everything is right as rain. And, and then all of a sudden things happen in life that cause us to question things, you know. Um, and, and we can sometimes fall into disappointment based on some of the H flags, which, which I'll get into, um, hurt, generally hurt, fear, anger, lust, guilt, shame. Um, and if we don't deal with them appropriately, we can, somehow, we can sometimes fall into what, what we have a disappointment. Um, and in the imperative mode, in mood, we actually are trying to work and walk the Christian walk on our own. And it's impossible, right? We cut God out of the picture. But when we receive forgiveness and we repent and we... We, we surrender to the Lord and His Holy Spirit. We can get back to the indicative mood and experience the fruit of the Spirit the way that we were meant to, and uh, again, and abide. But what I'm, we're going to be talking about, uh, well, we actually we, we covered worry and what worry was um, and why um, worry comes in in the imperative mode. Worry is the demand for answers. I, 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 need, I need help. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demand this now. This is imperative. Right, we're still cutting God out of the picture. It's kind of like I think I think my dad showed me the uh, the one definition of worry is praying really hard for something that we don't want. <laughs> I really like that. I, I gave a little bit different uh, explanation of what worry is actually um, in the last message, but um, overall, um, I introduced you to the four moods that that run in a basically our every season of life. Um, they run like seasons, four seasons. The indicative is when we start out. The imperative is when we when we are questioning. We have a little, you know, we're moving towards doubt in certain aspects of our life, undealt with health flags. Then we go into the subjunctive. Subjunctive mood is is a possibility here, where you could go either direction. There's it's like a junction of you could either start allowing God to rebuild your faith and grow and mature. Or you can start into disbelief and unbelief from your de deconstructing, right? We're going to go in. We're going to primarily uh, stick with the imperative and subjunctive moods um, this morning, and how de deconstruction leads to this here. Um, that's why I said this is, I'm on a, a, a well, but, but you know, but it's it's going to be good next week. This week will be good because we need to know this. We need to know where we're at personally, and we need to know for others that we do know that are struggling um, in this in this area in these areas. And, and I know a handful myself, so that they they are out there, and it's sad. Um, but you know, never fear. <laughs> we have um, the possibility of reconstructing our faith after deconstruction, and that is going to be next week. How to do that? How to go home? Our way home, right? Um, we, we learned last week that true peace does not come from understanding everything. 
from getting the answers to our why questions. If there's a God, why is their punishment, if there's a God, why is there hell, you know, um, which, you know, leads eventually to like universalism and what have you. Um, but the answers to those questions aren't going to bring you peace if you ever get them. And we learned um, about what the, the modern deconstruction uh, of people, it often leads people away from faith more so than rebuilding their faith. The difference between a healthy examination of one's faith and rebuilding or growth um, and the de and the and the versus the destructive path that leads to disbelief and detachment from God and that's what we're going to be covering today and that's why I said this is going to be a, this was one of the hardest ones to study because I had to go in and look at what is out there and it's not pretty it's 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 disturbing and um, almost surreal how much heresy and awfulness are are out there um, and the, the thing is is it's like you, the what what's what's hard about it is uh, all of this I'm going to flip this over because this is what we're going to be talking about today all at any point in our salvation experience in our walk we can return to God at any point he is there the grace is there for us to repent to 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 get health and healing and go back at any point but what we're we're going to talk about today is is the pathway down all the way down the rabbit hole um, because we know people that are here if it's not us right hopefully it's not you guys many of our why questions from you know they come from underlying fears and our why questions start usually up here in the disappointment phase. It's our personal experience. When we experience hurt, we get offended. Now, I'm talking about hurt in the church, even. If I can get you know, specifics, that could be um, you know, anything from church hypocrisy or whatever was being taught at your church, or maybe there was a pastor that was out of line and he's talking heresies, or, um, you know, like pastoral abuse, or you were hurt by another believer in the church. Um, these are the things that if you don't deal with right here, will start taking you down further. And, and what I've read and what I've, you know, I, I've studied at least eight different people that went down the tubes, so to speak, um, that it all starts up here in the emotions, in the undealt with, unchecked, hurt or fear they become offended in church where do you think is going to be healing you know all of this all of this side here and you'll see once i start explaining uh what deconstruction does all of this side is self this is all self everything this is cutting god out of the picture completely what happens this is what happens. You get disappointed. You don't deal with your offense and your hurt. You, you, you start to question, why did God allow that to happen? Why did he take that person away from me? Why did he, you know, there, there could be legitimate hurt, but it's what you do with it that, that's what matters, right? So if you don't deal with it, you eventually start doubting. You go from disappointment to doubt. And then your doubt, you experience anxiety, loneliness, you might feel vulnerable. The doubt phase, you're kind of, you're going to be kind of taking on things that last longer than just your hurt and offense and things. These, these if undealt with, will turn into almost like moods themselves, right? Something that you carry with you all the time, constant fear, anxiety, a fear, you know, a feeling of loneliness. Um, and then most people start at this point to isolate. When you question, this is where, you, like I said, this is where all the whys hit. And then you don't get any good answers. You either get none or unqualified. You search the internet, you ask your pastor, he's just not giving you the answers to the, the, what you want. You ask God, and all you hear is crickets. Um, that's, that's, that's the problem, because these are still not 
taken care of, you won't hear. Even if you're getting the correct answers the way that God wants. I mean, Job did it. Why would you let this suffering happen? And it's like, you know what? God's response didn't, he didn't answer his why. He just told him who he was. So you move from your questions, your why. You start to doubt because your answers stink, whatever you're getting, right? You think they do anyway. So then you isolate yourself. What's the Bible say about people that isolate? They seek their own. And what else? They come up against all sound wisdom. So they seek their own. You're seeking yourself. And you're button heads with all wisdom that comes to you. Even if it's godly wisdom, you, don't, you won't start not, not to agree with it. And if you don't stop there, you eventually go into what this is all about, is deconstruction. It's been a catch, catch word or catchphrase or whatever you want to call it. It's a stylish phase of what people are using nowadays to say that they deconstructed their faith. Um, deconstruction isn't always all bad. Deconstruction can lead to reconstruction that we'll, we're going to be talking about next week, which is going to be awesome. But this week, deconstruction will lead to a feeling of brokenness. These are your feelings. This is what you're experiencing on this side over here. Feeling of brokenness, maybe completely betrayed by God and God's people, even sometimes yourself. And you go in from deconstruction into disbelief if these aren't dealt with here. Disbelief, then, you'll be experiencing shame, depression. What is depression? Depression is anger towards, towards yourself. I didn't live up to what I, I believed. I, didn't, I was fooled. I was tricked. You, you start to avoid people. You, you start to avoid people of God. You uh, start to stay away from church. You don't want to gather um, anymore. Something tricky happens here, though. Because at this point, when you're, you, you, have, you, can, you bring in exposure to others, this is this point where you've accepted your disbelief so much so that you start forming your own theologies, your own truth. It's a, and, and, and you will be... Um, well, the truth is, in, 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 in these people's eyes, is fluid. It's your, it's your preference. It's the way that you d determine the scripture to read. Sometimes you could throw out scripture altogether. Um, but at this point, what is interesting is you, you expose yourself to others, which is like the online community and, and all of the other people that are de deconstructing at the same time, right? It's terrible. It's really terrible. And what happens after that? I mean, this is just going to be a brief summary, and I'll go through with it go through you with it with my notes in a minute. At this point, you've designed your own truth. You become arrogant. I, I, there's no other way to say it. There, you can be exposed and you could care less. This is where some people that have platforms like fallen worship leaders or pastors or um, writers, um, they use their platform that they had to express their deconstruction and their new truth and, and why it's so awesome that there's no hell anymore and how good they feel that there's this euphoric sense of, um, you know, the, a, the greasy grace thing and um, universalism and, you know, there's no hell, we're all good, this is awesome, you want to start evangelizing because you care about everybody, right? You want everybody to feel that weird, euphoric, I found myself, you know. Um, and this is not for every single case, but this is most, unfortunately, that I've read anyway. Um, but at this, at this point, you can, you, you fall, you flow into from just disbelief to basically unbelief. You're, you're done with church. You're done with faith. You're done with the people that are in church. You're tired of hearing them talk about Jesus. I mean, these people become either detached, um, 
they become very argumentative if you're trying to con if you're a, a Christian friend and you say anything you get you get an instant rebuttal they're bitter all of them I don't care at one point I mean at one point you have this little bit euphoric thing but if you confront what they're thinking and in fact most of these people can't get along very well because they have their own truths all of them and and just like our just like the 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 um the way that the different church churches went they have their own little beliefs here and then we don't believe in full immersion and we don't you know just like that they they have their own little thing minus god <laughs> it's bad this is really bad but none of them are happy none of them have the joy None of them are working, walking in the fruit of the Spirit. None of them are walking in the way that they, they should be. Um, it's, it's, it's disastrous. And what's really hard when I study this is, is that they are the pastors and the worship leaders and the people that, that had something from God, a gift from God even. But they stay in their head. And they never have relationship with Jesus. The real Jesus, the real truth. You stay in your head and that's where you end. That's why, guys, I, I don't want you to have fat heads. I think I might be the only pastor I've ever heard call the congregation fat heads. <laughs> but like I said before, it is 60% lipids of different types in your head, so your brain... <laughs> So it literally we are. <clears throat> Many of our why questions begin up here out of fear. Underlying fears that drive us to seek answers and control, just like worry. Worry is an attempt to control something that you are, want the situation to change in, right? When we dig deeper, we often find that behind our questions lie three main fears. One is the fear of the unattainable. The fear, this particular fear impacts our emotions, making us feel like we're never enough or that we're, we can't achieve our goals. We ask why as a way of seeking reassurance, hoping that understanding will prove our worth. Yeah, understanding will prove your worth, right? We think so, though, sometimes. But this fear only leads to a cycle of self-doubt and comparison. It affects our identity. I'm a failure. I'm no use. It's when, the, it's when those, you know, it's when those lies come in that if we believe them, they end up becoming traits instead of just states. False personalities, right? The second fear, the first fear is unattainable, the fear of the unattainable. Second fear is the fear of the uncontrollable. That's, that also pertains to like worry. This fear affects our will, leading us to seek control over our circumstances. We ask why to impose order on the chaos around us, hoping that answers will allow us to prevent future pain or disappointment. Yet life remains unpredictable and this need for control only leaves us feeling more vulnerable. Worry. I need to control. The third fear. Fear of the unknowable. And this is where we were talking about mostly what reflects in it. This fear affects our minds, creating a sense of darkness and confusion. And remember how we, we, we said if you put a mirror in front of another mirror, the infinity mirrors or infinity reflections go on forever. They get darker and darker, just like our thinking. <laughs> when we demand to know, when we demand to know things beyond our understanding, we end up frustrated, lost in a fog of questions that may never be answered. This fear pulls us away from the peace of trusting God's wisdom and leaves us in a cycle of speculation and doubt. I need all the answers is what that fear brings. Each of these fears pulls us away from God's peace 
and leads us into a deeper need for control. But rather than alleviating our fears, these whys only deepen our anxiety, keeping us trapped in a state of unrest. Today, what we're going to explore is what happens when our questions are not addressed properly before God and how they lead to doubt, disappointment, deconstruction of faith, and disbelief. This message is for those who are currently struggling, yes, but it's also for those who, you know, someone, a loved one, or somebody close to you that you know is going through it, um, in order that I might be able to bring at least a little bit of strategy, if not just empathy and support for them. Um, the juncture that I was talking about earlier happens in the deconstructive, or the, the deconstruction here, is in the subjunctive mood. Subjunctive mood. When we're in the subjunctive mood is when we're, we're in the isolating and doubting phase and we start the deconstruction and disbelief. There's a juncture where you could actually go one way or the other with your deconstruction. You could actually deconstruct in, with the mindset of I'm going to build or I'm going to tear apart or I'm going to find something different. I'm going to build something different, right? You either build for, what, growth and maturity, or you build to justify your unbelief and you, yourself. Here's some examples that I pulled off of. Well, these are like social media posts, right? These, these, these hurt me, so if I can get through them all, good. <laughs> a God that requires belief in it in order to avoid eternal punishment while also not providing exist, you know, evidence of his existence is not a loving God. I'm not going to derive my cosmology from a 4,000-year-old legend of a jealous, bloodthirsty demigod. If abortion is terminating a living thing you created that's still in formation stages, doesn't that mean God aborted an entire planet with the Great Flood? Hashtag ex-Christian. This one hurt me. In abusive relationships, one person convinces another person that they are worthless and no one else could ever love them. And that's why people stay in those relationships. This is also how the church operates. It's terrible. That's just a few. I mean, there's like hundreds. There's podcasts. There's. It's just a whole nother world of horribleness. Deconstruction defined. In a Christian context, deconstruction is not simply questioning or seeking deeper understanding, but it often involves dismantling traditional beliefs and practices associated with Christianity. This movement is marked by a strong emphasis on personal autonomy, where individuals reject most external authorities, including the Bible, their pastors, all in favor of self-guided spiritual journeys. However, this concept is not new. It finds, of course, its origins in the Bible's account of Satan's rebellion, where he exemplifies the ultimate rejection of authority and embrace of self-autonomy. Isaiah 14, 12 says, describes Satan's fall, where he declared, I ascend to the heavens, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. This passage demonstrates his desire to elevate himself above God, marking the first act of deconstruction against divine authority. In this, in this phase down here, when they're ready to, to basically share and, and testify of their new truth, um, just throwing that out there, is that this is when they, they feel that they were enlightened, that they, that they had, they found, it reminded me of, you know, 
the tree of knowledge and good and evil. You will be like God. You will, you will, you will know everything. You know. Mm. Anyway, just throwing it out there. The biblical distinction. The Bible encourages discernment and understanding and growing in knowledge, like in Hebrews 5.14 and Proverbs 2.2-5. 2, 2 through 5. However, biblical discernment differs from the de deconstruction in it that seeks to align personal beliefs with God's truth through relationship with Him, rather than replacing it with subjective interpretations of our own truth. Right? So I wanted to look at authority versus autonomy. Rejection of authority is one of the big things, right? Satan's actions show a clear rejection of God's established order. By choosing to question the ultimate, they ultimately reject God's rule. He sought to place his own will above God's. This, rebel, this rebellion is sought to... Um, this rebellion is actually mirrored in modern deconstruction, where individuals reject biblical authority in favor of self-determined beliefs. They focus on autonomy. This is, this is the process. They reject authority, they focus on autonomy. You're going to hear that a few times. At the core of Satan's rebellion was a desire for autonomy. The belief that he knew better than God and should control his own destiny this desire for personal authority is central to the deconstruction movement of today, as individuals often seek independence from traditional beliefs to shape their own truth. Biblical authority. Jesus commissions his followers to obey his teachings, as outlined in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. This emphasizes submission to his word and commands. The Bible serves as the ultimate guide, encouraging believers to trust its authority over self-made interpretations. Autonomy and deconstruction. In the modern deconstruction movement, there is a tendency to prioritize personal experience and feelings over scriptural truth and relationship with Jesus. Your own feelings of being offended, you're disappointed, and these, these feelings, not the fruit of the Spirit feelings, and putting that over the truth of what genuine relationship is with Jesus. This mindset rejects any fixed standard, leading to an emphasis on personal truth and subjective authority, rather than grounding faith in the objective truth of Scripture. On the, in the online communities, it's, it's so, oh, man. But you know what? Many people deconstruct their faith through the influence of social media personalities, and it's terrible, who encourage open criticism of traditional Christianity. Platforms like TikTok and YouTube create spaces where doubts and grievances about Christianity are shared, fostering an atmosphere that could easily lead individuals further away from their faith. The dangers of the echo chamber. Social media often amplifies the voices that challenge and dismantle Christian beliefs without providing balance or biblical, biblically grounded perspectives, or even historical truth for some, in some cases. This can create an echo chamber where individuals feel validated. And this is, this is all down here, where, where birds of a feather flock together they eventually argue, but, but at least they don't feel as isolated as they used to. They found their, they found their people is, ter is, is rotten. I can't, I can't say it any more than that. This can create an echo chamber where the individuals feel validated in rejecting the faith community, leading to a potentially isolating path where self is prioritized over community eventually and scripture. So eventually, it goes back into yourself. It's all self. It's just like complete self. This is terrible. <laughs> now, healthy discernment. Scripture encourages believers to test and examine their, their beliefs, like I said in, in 
um, and that's out of the first set Thessalonians 521 uh, Philippians 1 9 through 10 healthy questioning uh, when done in alignment with biblical principles and the proper heart attitude the proper source right it re it results in growth and maturity in faith but you can you can differ to differentiate between the two if you're talking to somebody and they're deconstructing it's easy to discern which one is which because of the source if one is saying i just i have all these issues and i want to come to this conclusion i want to take care of some of these things and i'm and i'm i'm curious how god's going to do it or i have you know all these issues and and god did this to me and i don't know why there's there's a slight deconstruction often lacks a constructive goal understanding why it has no construction in it at all it doesn't help why do i have a splinter in my foot even if you knew why does it really matter take the splinter out jesus wants you to get rid of the pain he doesn't want you to understand why that is there now of course you could say in a loving you know in in the, in the right attitude lord if there's a way for me to prevent that from happening again <laughs> i would like to know that and send me on that path right that would be the the great the way of growth in that process but most of the time the deconstruction uh, continues into skepticism and uncertainty. Without an anchor in God's word, this process can erode one's faith foundation and not build it up. The, the origin story of deconstruction, a lot of people go into who, who actually named deconstruction, and it was this you know, 20th century French dude, I don't remember his name, because it was irrelevant, because I want to know where it came from. And so when I looked at it, I was like, I, I was brought back to Satan's first, you know, his rebellion towards God. And it showed me, and, and, and I saw three parts that were deconstruction in a nutshell. First, like I said, he questioned God's authority. Second, he emphasized personal autonomy. And third, he rejected and replaced divine authority with his self authority deconstruction in in three small parts satan's initial tactic was to question the authority and truth of god's word by planting seeds of doubt he introduced the idea that god's commands could be contested or reinterpreted according to personal desire doesn't sound like some political folks um, satan promoted the idea of personal autonomy suggesting that individuals could determine truth for themselves rather than submitting to an external authority. This shift redirected the focus from obeying God's authority to prioritizing his own desires and judgments. The third, in the final stage, Satan outright rejected God's rule and replaced it with his own authority, seeking to elevate himself above God. This act of rebellion, that act of rebellion embodied the ultimate form of deconstruction, where he sought to establish his own throne above God's, illustrating a complete severance from submission to God. All of these, at any point in your life, if you're falling down these holes, surrendering and submission to God will bring you right back. Repentance, right? Always. There's always a way out. I saw this also... Because, you know, when, when you look at this, and I was like looking at it going, this is where they evangelize. This is where they get on the, the TikTok, YouTube. They have, you know, millions of followers. They, they say, hey, this is my new truth. You should, you should check this out. This is great. They evangelize very well. And they're adamant. Not happy, but they're adamant. <laughs> and so when somebody's adamant, I mean, really, I mean, it's, it's sad and sick. But when somebody's adamant, really, you, you tend people tend to to, to 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 believe, because they look like, wow, they really know what they're talking about. You know, I must. I don't think I look like that, because even though I, I feel like I do know, I always have that 
questioning towards the Holy Spirit of, I know I don't know everything. And, and, and if anything I'm missing, Lord, you know, reveal it to me through your wisdom. If you have that attitude, you won't end up on this side. <laughs> anyway, but what I thought was interesting, because they, they're, they're extremely great evangelists, and mo uh, honestly, a lot of them are evangelicals, ex-evangelicals. About 63% of the evangelical church went progressive and are falling in this problem. Yeah, scary stuff. But I was like, they, they're really good at evangelizing, even though they're ex vangicals <laughs> is what they call themselves. ex vangicals ex -vangelicals. Um so what, but I but I looked at it and I was like I see mirrored in 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 Adam and Eve in the fall Satan's fall and his rebellion the fall of Adam and Eve is a powerful example of how questioning and autonomy and self authority can lead us away from God's design as well I thought that was very interesting how they correlated since it was the same perpetrator involved in both. In their story, we see a progression that mirrors Satan's own rebellion, beginning with doubt, moving to self-determination, and ultimately rejection of God's authority. First, Satan's strategy started with a subtle question. Oh, why? No, he, he said, did God really say? Really? By questioning God's word, Satan planted a seed of doubt in, 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 in Eve's mind. He introduced the idea that perhaps God's commands could be reinterpreted. Sowing the notion that God's authority was not absolute. This moment marked the beginning of deconstruction for Adam and Eve, where God's truth was open for debate and his authority seemed less certain. Questioning God's authority, that was one, right? It mirrored the same, same as Satan's initial fall. The second was, was what emphasized personal autonomy. After undermining God's authority, Satan enticed Eve with the allure of personal autonomy, implying that she could be like God, knowing good and evil. She could be. This temptation promoted the idea that Eve didn't need to rely on God to define truth or her identity for that matter. She could determine it for herself. This was a major shift from living under God's authority to you know, prioritizing her own understanding and desires. Satan presented him <clears throat> self-sufficiency as a virtue, making it seem appealing to pursue her own path rather than God's. And, and that's where a lot of people get caught in this. Uh, the deconstructors, a lot of times, are, are they, 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 um, how should they, they, they bad mouth, they put down most Christians that believe the Bible, period. They, they have a tendency to be like, you guys are just nuts. I can't believe you believe in this God that never shows himself. And, you know, why would there be a hell if there's a loving God? Da, 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 you know, the questions are forever and they've been forever. Uh, but three, finally, in Adam and Eve's case, they rejected and replaced what? Divine authority with their own. In choosing to eat the fruit, Adam and Eve completed the cycle of rebellion by acting on their own judgment over God's command. They rejected God's rule, choosing instead to follow their own understanding. This act represented the ultimate form of deconstruction. They dismantled their dependence on God and placed their own authority above his. They substituted submission to God's authority with self-governance, resulting in a tragic severance from his presence and his purpose for them. The severance from the presence. And that's what happens when you stay in your head and you never deal with these toxic emotions. You never experience the presence of God. You never experience that again, even if you did. There's always a way back, like I said, but, and, but this is separation from his presence. We see how easily the desire for autonomy and control can spiral 
to the full rejection of God just by looking at Adam and Eve's story. It serves as a warning on you know, how deconstruction, when driven by doubt, pride, or self-interest, ultimately leads to separation from God. It also reminds us that true freedom in life are not found in redefining God's truth, but in surrendering to it. Amen. Satan's temptation of Eve through the tree of the knowledge, which I thought was really great because all of the why questions that we ask are to fulfill that gap and that void of, I don't know why. I want to know why, right? The knowledge, filling our heads with knowledge, the tree of knowledge. I would so much rather have life. <laughs> Take part of life than all the stuff that I know. Let God give me the wisdom to deal with whatever I do know. You know, it's terrible. But they, because of the, the, the particular type of evangelism that happens, let's, let's go in this a little bit deeper. And those three parts, again, were they question God's authority. They emphasize personal autonomy, and they replace divine authority with self-authority. Deconstruction in a nutshell. So let's go. I'm going to go a little bit deeper with, with, with Eve. The first thing that Satan highlighted was that the fruit was good for food. It was appealing to the basic physical need and desire for sustenance. It was appealing, right, to a basic real need. This seemingly innocent observation subtly suggested that God's command to avoid the tree, he might be withholding something beneficial from her. Why would God deny her something that appeared good and nourishing? This led Eve to question God's authority and intentions. Authority and intentions. If the fruit was good, perhaps God's restriction wasn't fair or even trustworthy. By framing the fruit as beneficial, Satan planted the seeds of doubt that, about God's motives, implying that his authority might not be absolute or perfectly good. This initial step invited Eve to entertain the possibility that God's commands could be questioned. It was pleasing to the eye, emphasizing personal autonomy. Satan drew Eve's attention to the fact that the fruit was pleasing to the eye. This appeal was aimed at her desires and sense of beauty, suggesting that she had the right to decide what was desirable or good. By focusing on her aesthetic appreciation of the fruit, Satan encouraged Eve to embrace her personal desires as, a, as, valid, as a valid basis for her actions. Here he emphasized personal autonomy the right to my own preferences, the idea that she could determine what was right and good independently based on her own perception. If something was attractive and desirable to her, perhaps it should be pursued. Hmm? Regardless of God's command, maybe? Hmm. This shifted her focus from obedience to God to following her own judgment, promoting the idea that her own preferences and desires were more important than in de divine instruction. It was desirable for gaining wisdom, replacing divine authority with self-authority. Finally, Satan, represented, <clears throat> Satan presented the fruit as desirable for gaining wisdom. This last appeal went to the heart of Satan's lie. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here he promised that eating the fruit would give Eve a godlike knowledge elevating her position of authority over her own life. This was the ultimate rejection of God's authority and an invitation to self-sovereignty. By claiming that she could know God or know good and evil like God does, Satan was enticing her to replace God's rule with her own, to be the one that decides right from wrong without needing to depend on God. This final step completed the deconstruction of her faith and obedience as she shifted from reliance on God to reliance on herself. Questioning God's authority, it was good for food. The fruit appeared to be beneficial, causing her to doubt whether God's prohibition was truly in her best interest. Emphasizing personal autonomy was pleasing to the eye. The fruit, its beauty appealed to her personal desires. 
encouraging her to trust her own judgment and desires over God's command. Replacing divine authority over self-authority. The promise of wisdom tempted her to believe she could be like God, effectively replacing his authority with her own. And these three steps led to the fall. As Eve ultimately chose to act on her desire, rather than submit to God's instruction, this tragic sequence serves as a warning for us today. When we begin to question God's commands, prioritize our own autonomy, and elevate our judgment above his, we risk following in the same path of separation that Adam and Eve did. That was deconstruction in three steps. Deconstruction in one step is develop pride and keep it. I don't take you from point A to, to, to zero, point A to Z, whatever you want to call it, death. Just develop pride. Keep it. Hold on to it. Nourish it. And you'll be done in one step. Exploring the outcomes of why questions in the Bible. Did you know how many people ask why in the Bible? So, there were so many. I, I got tired of, of, of listening. I mean, if you go just through uh, Lamentations or or um, where David talks in Psalms, man, people ask why all the time. And, and they still, I mean, King David asked them all the time. And, and yet he, he ended up being a man after God's own heart. You know, that would it do all, you know, all that he asked? You know, even, even as, as much as having a part of the lineage of Jesus in his blood. It just, it amazes me. But it's what you do with it. It's what you do with the why. Um, next week I'm going to get into a lot of um, actually more uplifting parts of this. <laughs> because this is so dark. I mean, this is so dark and, and very emotional for me to, when I was like studying for it. Um, but even the, when, you look at, when, you, when you think about the scriptures, who, who comes to mind first about the whys? To me it was... Job, David, you know, um, Job's, you know, in conscious, he was, he was a righteous dude, man. He was like, he did good. And then, and then all this garbage happened to him. He lost his wealth, his children, his health. He was in anguish and he questioned why such calamities befell on him. Pretty common question for a lot of us, right? Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? He also asked, why do the wicked live on and, and they grow old and they increase in power? King David. David faced all kinds of trials, including being pursued by King Saul and dealing with all his personal failures um, through like Psalm 51. Why, Lord, do you stand off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which, of course, Jesus himself spoke from the cross. Habakkuk, he questioned God's tolerance of injustice. The prophet Habakkuk was troubled by the rampant injustice and violence in Judah. Why do you make me look at injustice? I don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> why do you tolerate wrongdoing? And th these are questions asking, asked to God. <coughs> Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up more and more righteous than themselves? Moses questioned his role in, 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 in all of God's plan. He, he felt inadequate at first, right? He stuttered and all that. Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Why did you ever send me? Gideon. Question God's presence amidst the, the, the oppression of the time, the Midianites. Israel was oppressed by the Midianites, and Gideon doubted God's concern for his people. The why question here was, pardon me, Lord. Um, at least he was polite. He said, pardon me, Lord. Gideon replied, but, but if the Lord is with us, why is all this happening to us? Do any of these sound familiar? Um, Asaph, he struggled with the prosperity of the wicked. I heard this one over and over in my head when I was studying. What, what is it? Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, but, you know, when I tried to understand all of this, it troubled me deeply. 
when I tried to understand all of this, it troubled me deeply. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> it troubled you deeply. But at least they went to the Lord in their questioning. They didn't, they didn't go to their friends and other people that were destructing, deconstructing, right? Or <laughs> destructing, really. Elijah questioned his purpose amidst despair, too. You know, while, while not directly, you know, phrased as a why question, he expressed his despair. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Remember that one? Even Jesus, you know, when he, when he was talking, when he was on the cross, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What I want to go through, what I'm going to go through next week is what they actually did to come out of that doubt and, and disillusionment before they went down this path. They didn't, most of them didn't go down this path. There, there, there is one person in the Bible that, that um, is often um, used as a, as a, somebody that actually did this and then ended up down here. Um, uh, is Demas. Demas. But I'll, I'll go in that in, in, in next week's teaching. Because um, because Paul confronted you know Paul was not real happy with him, um, but in the process, all of these people that were in question here that question why 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 God, some of the answers that God gave them is is were totally bonkers compared to the why questions that they were asking. I mean, like like I said at the beginning, Job's answers that he got from God didn't answer his why. It, it does, he, he said instead it was like he revealed who he was. And then that changed Job's perspective. And he went back into the indicative mode. <laughs> indicative mood, right? Um, because he dealt with this appropriately before God. Anyway, that's just one example. But there, I mean, there's several. I mean, the, the, even the disciples, they question, they question him all the time. Um, why couldn't I drive the demon out? Why? Why is this person first, and that has to, that person has to be last? Why, you know, he they question Jesus all the time, just like we do now. It's just what do you do with these whys? What is wisdom in your pursuit? How does that, you know, in your relate? It's all about relationship. If you decide to not have relationship with the, with the Lord through the Holy Spirit, you will end up this way. Period. Relationship brings it all back. Um, anyway, so I, I think I'm, I, I gave you enough to chew on for today. Yeah. Um, so I just, I just want to, as we, as we wrap up the rest of the series, the, the Why Ask Why series, and we go into the next teaching, um, it's clear that the, the you know the weight of the unanswered whys will you know can can weigh heavy on us and keep us isolating and and and, and in doubt if we don't uh, allow God to take care of them in, in the process. Um, they could lead us down the path that that actually goes into deconstruction and disbelief if they're left unchecked. But uh, <clears throat> in each of these stories, though, there's a, there's an invitation. No matter what, like in, in either, no matter where you're at in here. There's always an invitation to come back and, and come back home. And so next week, what I wanted to really get into is, is, is this right here. Instead of exposure to others of like-minded, you know, birds of a feather, we go to exposure to God. And we just are like, I just lay everything down. And it's part of the scripture that, that the Lord gave me, you know, when I first got here was just like this is all part of, like if this was like a, a Lego building and you were deciding to deconstruct after all of these disappointments and things and you're de deconstructing and you're pulling out stuff, you're pulling block after block and you just end up with a big pile of blocks. Where here you can start to build something, everybody's is going to look different. You can force this on other people, but eventually they're not going to believe you either. And you end up being bitter and argumentative. Or you could say, all these, all these blocks on the table here, 
God, I just give them to you. Reorganize my life. Um, and, the, and the scripture that God gave me when I came here was the same thing. It was, what, 2 Samuel, was it 2 Samuel 2, 22? 2 Samuel 2, 21 through 25. God made my life complete when I showed him all the mess of my life, when I laid it out all before him, all the pieces of my life before him. He, he made me complete. He, and, and, and I think that, that that really goes to show you this is what happened to me. I deconstructed. Um, but there's, there's always, no matter what point, you know, if you're in the pig pen, you know, or if you're, you know, just doubting and having some isolation issues, <laughs> at any point, God will take you back. Our journey is not about silencing our questions, but about shifting where they actually lead us to. Instead of demanding answers, let's see each why as an opportunity to draw closer to God, to just surrender control, and to deepen in our faith. When our questions start to weigh us down, remember that true peace doesn't come from knowing everything. Like I said, it comes from trusting the one who does. In our next teaching, uh, we're going to explore how to move from the state of disillusionment in, in the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood is here. And, and moving back into an optative mood, which is hope. And eventually back into experiencing the fruit of the Spirit. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for being so patient with us in our questions and our doubts. Teach us to bring our whys to you with humble hearts, not demanding answers, but trusting in your wisdom and love. Help us to let go of the need to control and instead, rest in your peace. Guide us, Lord, through, your times of, through our times of questioning, Father, and disappointment, so that our journey brings us closer to you rather than leading us away. And Father, we ask for your grace to move from doubt into hope, from fear into trust. Lead us into a deeper, more intimate relationship with you and prepare our hearts for the transformation that you desire. As we prepare to enter the next part of this series, open up our hearts to your reformation and let our faith be firmly grounded in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources, and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.